The Chris Abraham Show. Welcome to Season 4, Episode 10 of The Chris Abraham Show. My name's Chris Abraham, and today's going to be really short. Because I think it's important to understand what other countries do to try to mitigate climate change and scarcity and all these other kinds of things. Pollution... uh, it's really hard to compare, and uh, I'll explain in a second. Usually, the reason why another country goes to extreme uh, goes to extremes to protect its environment or to protect its resources, so on and so forth, are twofold. The main reason I've seen has been cost. And the second thing I've seen is 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 an ideology, a, a true belief uh, that you, that we, that one, that we humans are the stewards, uh, the stewards, stewards, not stewards. We're not the stewards. I'm the Abrahams, uh, the stewards of the environment. So when we come back from the break, I'll go into it pretty funny stories. First, I'll talk about my time in England, which was quite amusing. And then I'll talk about my time in in Berlin. And I'll try to talk a little bit about my time in Utrecht in the Netherlands. Um, But I don't really have any context. I didn't live there long enough. And I basically uh, couch surfed uh, on someone else's dime. So, I will talk to you in a second. Oh, thank you. Welcome back to Season 4, Episode 10 of Chris Cast. Um, I lived in England for a year, studying American literature in Norwich. In Norwich, uh, in no ways was it dry, or in any way did it suffer. Um, But what I did notice, in Great Britain, in... Norwich, I don't have a lot of other context, is that just things are expensive and it water is not uh, as cheap and abundant, uh, electricity is not as cheap and abundant, and as a result, people tend to do things as efficiently and as cheaply as possible. For example, Europeans in general consider our method of um, refrigerators, toilets, and uh, especially water heaters to be extremely wasteful. They just don't understand our water heaters at all. To have a device that constantly heats as much water as possible, like enough to basically give baths to a dozen people. They they don't understand that an entire side of a residential building is dedicated to a um, 
a vessel that can give everybody in the neighborhood a, a quick shower. Uh, I used to think it was more to do with the fact that the Brits do not have a shower everyday culture and neither do the Germans. But I also think that it ha comes down a lot to cost of gas, cost of heating oil, cost of electricity, and cost of water. I know that when I lived there in the early 90s and when I uh, lived with my, well, when I visited my girlfriend who lived in Norwich proper in a uh, shared uh, house, I realized, you know, they've got a, a whole culture of having the having a heating element at the at the shower itself. Like it's right there when you take a shower, and if you live in a civilized household, there would be a little area to in the shower um, underneath the head where you can put your. Uh, your shampoo and conditioner and body wash and that kind of deal. Uh, I guess you would call it a shower caddy. When I when I visited her and many other homes, they had, if you will, a little repository, uh, sort of a radiator, a rod otter, a radiator of curved tubes in a um, kind of a rectangular metal box and when the water was going towards the nozzle for your shower it was being heated in real time so there was no vessel of of hot water in a water tank i know i say water terribly i apologize it's so weird even i don't like to listen to it but i can't say it when i say water Water, it really stresses my face. So, water. Um, and that was really interesting. I thought that that, you know, it only works while you're showering. The rest of the time, the water is just tap water. It's the, it's the temperature of the uh, world outside. Um, it comes straight from the, uh, f you know, it doesn't have an intermediary place, you know, in your basement. Or... In a building's basement, you could very quickly and easily um, make hot water in your in any new uh, any new uh, bathroom that you add to a building or to a house. Uh, you do not need to make sure that you have lines for both uh, hot and cold water. I didn't consider or think how the um, how the sinks worked, but I was very aware about how uh, the water worked like that. I, I don't remember how the water worked. I believe that in the apartment I lived in in Berlin, I believe that there was a small reservoir of hot water. I don't think that it worked uh, at point of sale, point of shower, POS, but I might be wrong. People are really, really, and, and it makes a lot of sense now, and it made a lot of sense then. Things are really expensive in Europe, and for whatever reason, you know, it's even worse now because of the war in Ukraine and because of the politics associated with Russian gas and oil and with regards to the general market and market rate. And the um, brinksmanship that the OPEC countries are playing with regards to uh, liking the price of oil being high. I mean, it makes uh, millionaires billionaires and makes billionaires multi-billionaires and trillionaires. So, but it's just, it's part of a, a culture. There's a culture of people in the UK and way more in Great Britain. Uh, and you can see that in terms of the Germans. When I lived in Germany, it's extremely, uh, extremely obvious. I mean, when I visited friends in London or even in, in the UK, uh, in University of East, 
University of East Anglia when I lived in the Ziggurat, which is a dormitory, um, there were things like auto-off lights and um, all kinds of other ways to try to mitigate the waste of electricity. But it's taken to an entirely different level in Berlin. I, I, I haven't lived anywhere else in Berlin, but if you go to any German city, um, the hallway lights are on a timer and they go off and you need to turn them on with a button and then they go off and you need to turn them on again and I guess people could hide in the shadows. Um, this is the same way in in hostels, it's the same way in office buildings, it's the same way in uh, not only hallways but entranceways and it's the way if you go to a European style or European or any international hotel, uh, you need to put your card that you are given to enter your room into a repository just inside the door in the entranceway. And when you insert the card into that slot, it turns on the electricity for the room. So when you leave the room, you can't do what we Americans do, which is leave the TV on so people think someone's there, leave all the lights on, etc., etc., etc. I have a funny story. It's funny to me. Um, I didn't know that this is how Berlin worked. And as background, um, people joke that not only is Berlin one of the most lushly watery places in the world, but it's surrounded by lakes, it has enormous water resources and so forth, but everybody is so ideologically sold. And I, I lived in Berlin in 2008, 2009, and 2010. So, uh, in, 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 so, uh, and also 2007. But the thing is, is that it's such an ideological thing. It's so ingrained. I mean, when I lived even in the 90s in D.C., there would constantly be uh, environmental innovation uh, and efficiency uh, challenges that were happening on the mall and so forth. And the Germans always won them. They're so ideologically devoted to mitigating and preventing climate change into not wasting natural resources and all those things that the joke is is that Berlin constantly smells like piss and shit and the reason why Berlin smells like piss and shit is because nobody flushes the toilet uh, people um, refuse to flush the toilet, they refuse to use much water, and as a result, the, um, and this might be, it might be urban legend, but the, um, the systems, uh, the, um, uh, the underground, what are they called, comment dieu, the, uh, the sewer systems, the sewer systems do not get enough water through them. Um, as a result, the uh, system, the way it's set up, it just does not move. It requires water and the movement of water through Berlin to drive the detritus, the shit and piss, through the tunnels into the refinement area. So in the middle of the summer... When people are being their B.O.B.O. -BO environmentally conscious self, the place smells like New York does all the time. Um, it's really very weird. Uh, the deepest, darkest parts of the summer, I think. I think they might have mitigated it by having a routine... Uh, way of just flooding the tunnels and kind of scraping it off like that, like just sort of flooding the tunnels and making sure that during certain times of the year they must have done something but it was kind of like a low-key point of pride 
to celebrate the fact that the Berliners, even though they've got an infinite amount of water, uh, they're not living in Las Vegas where all the water needs to be transported or even New York City where all the water needs to be shuffled in from, um, from upstate New York. They live in a place that has uh, extreme amounts of local resources in terms of uh, vegetables, food, water, all those other kinds of things. And still, the, the ethos, the uh, identity of Berliners are to be gentle with the earth. Um, here's another story. I lived in an apartment that was on the ground floor of a three or four story building. Each floor had its own apartment. It was, it's one of the guard buildings associated with the Panopticon Park, uh, near in Anvil, in Anvilinstrasse, Anvilinstrasse, Anvilinstrasse? Uh, in right across the street from the uh, Hauptbahnhof, Berlin Hauptbahnhof, right there at the edge of Tiergarten and Moabit. And I didn't know that people, when they leave their apartments in Berlin, turn off everything. They turn off they even turn off like the equivalent of a porch light or a one light in the apartment so that when you come home at night, you have a light to see your way or just a way to make thieves think that someone's home or, you know, anything. I would get in so much trouble from my German friends because to leave any light on in an apartment means that someone's there and they will knock at the door and look in the windows and wonder what the hell's going on and even though there was never any level of escalation that resulted in anybody calling um, the first responders to see if I had fallen and couldn't get up it was really frustrating to people when they came to just drop by Germans are very social just drop by and I wasn't there even though they saw very clearly that a light was on it was very poor form uh, it became very I became very aware that everything in the free-for-all socialist socialist uh, Europe everything has a meter on it you know you make phone calls there's meters on it you get hot points there's meters on it this might have just been the fact that it was 2010 this might be unlimited now but there's a real incentive to go and you and get wi-fi in the house or use wi-fi at a cafe because just tethering your phone uh or or uh, i also was able i had a black a bluetooth that could do voip and so i could i could receive 202 area code American phone calls in Berlin as if I lived in the United States with no charge at all because um, BlackBerry was extremely cutting edge with regards to that. So my BlackBerry was my U.S. phone. No, nope. Only people who knew I lived in Berlin knew I lived in Berlin. Otherwise, I can just, you know, be from anywhere with... Uh, Wi-Fi, and at that point, it was, you know, it was um, Skype. I, I think that Skype was the only thing that you could use. But uh, lots of money in the Skype phone calls, Skype numbers, Skype this, Skype that, and plus my... But the point is, is that I got a, a Romanian girlfriend who lived in um, Frankfurt am um, something. Frankfurt am um, Main. Frankfurt, Frankfurt, Frankfurt am um, um, Main. Mine. I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, she lived close to there. I think she was a spy. But I wanted to, I wanted to call my girlfriend. So I would, you know, make phone calls and 
it was ex- as expensive to call her all the time as I think it was when I lived in Hawaii in the 70s and 80s and needed to call people in New Jersey. Like, I think I freaking accidentally ran up a thousand euro bill. And, you know, m- the company, my company, Mark and my, our company took the hit. But, you know, uh, you got to be careful. And that was a phone that I bought with my residency permit. It was a it was a, um, a a German phone from Deutsche Telekom. It wasn't even a uh, a stupid roamer. Um, I left that BlackBerry in the apartment. I left that BlackBerry in the apartment as sort of, if you will, a house phone, and I went out and about with a uh, with a phone that was. Um, that had uh, Deutsche Telekom, I think, or Orange, I don't know, whatever, SIM uh, SIM card. So that's all I got to share with you, man. Like, it's it's especially going to be terrible for the people this winter. I, I, was, I listened to a lot of weird podcasts, and one of them that I've really cottoned to are local podcasts for rural areas in Great Britain and right now they're all talking about you know issues with charging up their their oil with lower fees and popping it to newer fees and trying to play the game of like trying to get oil at the best prices maybe putting in some extra money uh to charge up you know kind of a futures thing to take advantage of the price of oil now and, if you will, load up with a lot of oil or heating oil and and gas and so forth for your system for your home now and how there's technical glitches that are making all that money people put in uh, be readjusted to the current price. And so it's going to be devastating. But I would say that... People in Europe are true blue. Greta, Greta Thunberg or Thunberg or Thunberg is not a is not a um, a rare unicorn. There is a strong association with, and and you know if you go over there, you'll quickly know why. Everybody's on top of each other. Um, the entire of the European Union. Hey Google, does uh, how how many states? Does the entirety of the European Union fit in the United States? I don't know, because I found these results on search. I don't know. How many European Europe's fit into the USA? It's easy to forget how large the United States is for one country, especially when you compare it to a continent like Europe that's made up of so many smaller countries. According to a neat overlay map posted to Reddit by user uh, Martin W. Fan, you can fit 30 European countries into the continental U.S. I don't know which countries, but it's uh, it's it's notable. You know, Germany. Hey, Google. How big is Germany compared to a United States state? On the website via travelers.com, they say the Federal Republic of Germany is a pretty big country, coming in at around 357,021 square kilometers. That's about the size of Texas in the United States. As for population, Germany has a little over 80 million people living within its borders. So... Entire the entirety of Germany is about the size of Texas. So, um, when you realize that there's a lot of people, there's hey Google, what's the population of Texas? In 2020, the population of Texas was 28 million 635,442. And Google, what's the current population of Germany? In 2020, the population of Germany was 83,240,525. So, there's that, you know, you have to really understand that there's a, a different level of density. Hey Google, what is the uh, uh, population density of, of the EU? According 
According to European Commission, European Union, the population density, meaning the number of people per square kilometer, was on average 109 persons per square kilometer in the EU in 2019, a value which varied significantly between member states. Hey Google, what is the population density of the United States? 94 people per mile less than sub greater than 2 less than, sub greater than. On the website worldometers.info, they say, the USA ranks number 3 in the list of countries by population. The population density in the United States is 36 per square kilometer, 94 people per square mile. I don't know, I wasn't paying attention. Hopefully that means something to you, and I'm sorry if I didn't expect this guy to be playing my phone, and I have a feeling like it blasted uh, the recorder, so I hope that it has some sort of limitations, because i sorry if I blasted your eardrums. So, as a result, it's really amazing uh, to see that kind of thing, like the difference between the places in Europe that I've lived. I don't know what it's like in countries in Asia. I don't know what it's like. Uh, I don't know what it's like. I was talking to Mark about it, and Mark says that, like, you know, even showering and bathing and so forth uh, is only recently something you do every day. Uh, I don't know if that has to do with uh, different priorities in hygiene. I would think that someone who does athletics or sports every day takes a shower every day. I can't imagine someone who goes in a jog, uh, just finishes their jog, dries off, changes their clothes, and goes out uh, amongst people having sweated for an hour or so. I just don't understand. It doesn't make any sense to me. I would love to live in France for a while to see what it's like there. Um, Mark is currently obsessed with uh, with Lisbon and Portugal, uh, and I would love to see how people deal with resources in Mexico City, which is a uh, mega city, and um, I'm so fascinated by Mexico City. I I hope I can be one of the uh, many terrible digital nomad Americans who uh, drive up the cost of living and rental prices in Ciudad de Mexico. Anyway, I don't know if this was useful at all. Like I said, I'm going to be doing so many of these that they'll just sort of blend in and you won't be that pissed at me about any single one. And I just assume, based on Rule 34... Hey, Google, what is Rule 34? According to Wikipedia, Rule 34 is an internet maxim which asserts that internet pornography exists concerning every conceivable topic. The concept is commonly depicted as fan art of normally non-erotic subjects engaging in sexual behavior. It can also include writings, animations, and any other form of media to which the internet provides opportunities for proliferation. According to Wikipedia, Rule 34 is an internet maxim which asserts that internet pornography exists concerning every conceivable topic. The concept is commonly depicted as fan art of normally non-erotic subjects engaging in sexual behavior. It can also include writings, animations, and any other form of media to which the internet provides opportunities for proliferation. Wow, you said that twice. I think you have a stroke. Anyway, stop. Hey, Google, stop. Sure. Stopping off is Roku. Ah, okay, well... I am going to go back to the real world. I hope this was interesting. Uh, a lot of mistakes have happened. I will try better next time. I will remove this from my list of topics. There's a bunch of topics that I want to cover. And this one is was called Stories of Berlin's Climate Stores, uh, Stories of Berlin's Climate Stuff. So that happened. And I will talk to you soon. I'll be back with uh, information on how you can contact me.
Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. This is Season 4, Episode 10 of The Chris Abraham Show. I really should record this and just give it to you pre-recorded every time, but apparently I feel like I have to see if I can remember all of my social media places you can reach me every time again and again and again. Uh, you can reach me at chris at abraham.su. My f- website is chrisabraham.com. You can find me at Chris Abraham on most of the sites, on Twitter at Chris Abraham, Instagram at Chris Abraham, YouTube at Chris Abraham, uh, Facebook.com slash Chris Abraham. Uh, you can call me at plus one two zero two three five two five zero five one. Uh, you can text me there. It's my cell phone. You can uh, use that phone number to contact me via Signal or um, uh, Telegram or uh, all the other things. What is the other thing? Yikes. I completely had a brain fart. There's Telegram, there's Instagram, there's Twitter, there's Signal, there's Telegram. Ah, WhatsApp. You can reach me on WhatsApp, too. Uh, Other than that, I don't think I am really active on anything else. I'm not really on Snapchat. I'm too old for that. And all the other things. So... Oh, uh, linkedin.com slash in slash Chris Abraham, although I'm never there. Uh, And if you want to schedule a call, you can reach me at calendly.com slash Chris Abraham slash 15, and we'll chat for free. And I'll talk to you soon. A duma, au wiedersehen, hasta luego, hasta mañana, tschüssi. And uh, I'll talk to you soon. Love you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to The Chris Abraham Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Until next time.